Good evening. My name is John Kenyon, and I'm the Executive Director of the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature Organization. And I'd like to welcome you to the second night of the 2016 Iowa City Book Festival. But tonight we are pleased to present Michelle Hoover, who will discuss her new novel, Bottomland. Michelle is a native of Ames and is the Fanny Hurst Writer in Residence in Brandeis University, and she teaches at Grub Street, where she leads the Novel Incubator Program. She's a 2014 NEA Fellow and has been a writer in residence at Bucknell University, a McDowell Fellow, and winner of the Penn New England Discovery Award. Her debut novel, The Quickening, was a 2010 Massachusetts Book Award must read. Her new novel, Bottomland, follows the Iowa-based Hess family in the years after World War I as they attempt to rid themselves of the anti-German sentiment that left a stain on their name. Kirkus, in its review, called the book a lyrical, at times mysterious, and dreamy tale of family ties, and went on to say, deftly imagined and written, Hoover's second novel offers an intriguing modern take on a classic American landscape. Would you please help me welcome to this podium, Michelle Hoover. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, Let's see. Um, I just want to thank John and for inviting me here. It's really great for me to be back in Iowa. I actually grew up in Ames. My father was a finance professor there. I did not take on his <laughs> uh, accounting acumen, even though I was advised to do so. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm now in Massachusetts, but I do like to come back. So this book, Bottomland, it's my second book. Um, do any of you guys know the, what Bottomland means? Anybody? Yes, I see some heads. Do you know what bottom land means? This, yes, right here. Probably the low land by a river or something that will flood. Yes. Periodically. Yes. Very rich soil. Very rich soil. So for farmers, it can be a wonderful um, place to own land, but it can also be dangerous because it oftentimes floods. So the reason why I wanted to choose this title um, is because it's both a place of creativity and destruction. And you will find that throughout the book, that these families' lives um, are, are, many, are falling apart, fall into ruin, but it also leads them to make new discoveries for themselves. Um, I, told, uh, I chose to tell the book in five first-person voices. And if there are any ri uh, uh, writers in the room, I, I recommend not doing that. <laughs> it's, re it's really hard. And it took, that's probably what I spent most of the time on is making sure that the voices really sounded different. Um, the five voices are uh, of the Hess family that I write about. And this is a family in 1920, uh, uh, northwestern Iowa. Um, and they have been heavily ostracized from their community because they're a German-American family. And this um, takes place just after the First World War. Um, the father of the family uh, is one of the voices, as well as the oldest sister. We also hear from the two youngest sisters and one of the brothers that goes to war to fight in World War I. I'm actually going to read a little out of chronology of the book and start with John Julius, who's the father of the family, just to kind of introduce you. Um, he says, in the year 1892, I was a young man of little more than 30, stealing passage from an old German woman who expired on the docks before she was boarded. She had blue cheeks in the time I discovered her. Her woolens were so thickly bound about her throat and chest, I never could hope to save her, long past saving as she was. Her hand rested stiffly on her stomach, her ticket wavered from the tips of her fingers as if offering it up. I touched her wrist and felt it cold, gazed back at the foreign village where I was friendless and sure to starve, and slipped that ticket from her grasp. God forgive the young their desperateness. Now nearly as old, I would pay for such unhappy luck, yet little had I known of its opposite then. In the weeks as they passed, I stayed secreted on that ship, Securing room for myself in the lower burrs, I was a farm boy with a rent in his trousers. I reeked of pigs. If spied on the decks, I feared I would in an instant be pitched overboard, a trespasser no matter what ticket I held. In the evenings when the skies closed and the storms fell, I sweated in my bunk, 
The air was so very dense with smoke and stench, my head inched. They offered us a mattress stowed with seaweed, a life preserver for a pillow, a tin pail for meals of herring and soup. My stomach turned. The lamps on such rocky waters were too dangerous to light. I tucked my knees to evade the rats. Still the ocean swells plagued my sleep. I stood in the morning so sickened I doubted I had opened my eyes. In the daytimes I dared walk the decks to, open the to escape the hordes below. When I grew tired, my legs unsure, I hid behind the vents and surveyed the horizon for land. One week more. One dreaded week. The engines of the ship bore on. On the upper level, a woman perched her child on the rail, gripping only his waist. The child was small, barely two years old. He was calm as he looked out. The woman cooed to him under her hat. She had a lovely, pale face, a little younger than myself. A ribbon bound a nest of hair off her neck. The hair was a fiery red, her cheek the wider against it, and I felt a stirring when the wind lifted her skirt from her ankles. Now and again, she closed her eyes. Her fingers loosened from the waist of that jumper. The child was oblivious. He leaned forward in the arms of his mother, reaching for the sea. When must we learn to fear? And if not from our parents, from whom? I miss the land my father worked. I miss the house where my mother had me born. Sitting on deck on those dull waters, I missed my boots on the soil. In the dark of the evenings, I imagined that old woman as she snatched her ticket back. This voyage had taken from me something I never dreamed. My assurance there was a place for me, the steadiness of my limbs, home. The idea alone is not solid enough to carry with us. Yet without it, on what can we stand? If I reach the far side, I pray the new world proves steady. I might place my feet on the ground, build a life worth these many miles. Once I achieve that, I vowed I would leave the good earth never again. I am an old man now. I sleep in my slippers because my feet grow cold. I know men who sleep far deeper than I. I know women who visit them in churchyards. Yet I cannot truly sleep in any sense of the word. The room is dark, I tug at my blanket. What a waste of time the evening is for the old, all those many hours between sunset and sunbreak. When I close my eyes, the swell of that sea always are with me, the never-ending tide of the river against its banks. How often I have tried to keep the waters under my thumb how much they have from us stolen. If the old woman in her ticket laid a curse, I have seen it play itself out once and again. Why might a man lock the doors of his house? Why can he never forget the trespasses against him? He makes his confession, yet confessing never erases the act. Try as I might, the language is wrong. The sentences slip. My ease with the old tongue is fading, and I am left only with this English, its many contradictions, its 20 ways of saying one thing. Years ago, when I stood on the deck of that ship, the sea reflected the sun. It lit my face from beneath. I believed I might go blind from the light. Even now, I blink when I think of it. Me, only 23, and ignorant of everything, save what I could grow with my own hands. Born as I was a farmer, raised in the northern German lands of wheat. The rest of my life, I learned little I would find important, about war, perhaps, about children and the duties of family. Yet these are not light. I could not make of them that. So that's the father. Um, between the two sections, when he um, travels from his homeland, he's really eager for land. And in Germany back then, um, the parcels of land allowed to the sons were just going smaller and smaller and smaller as the families grew larger. There was really nothing for them to make and, and own of their own. And so he decided to leave and come here. Um, but his hunger for land does get him in trouble here. He also likes to keep to himself, um, and that gets him in trouble as well. 
particularly during a time in World War I when keeping to yourself um, as a new immigrant wasn't really allowed. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, I first thought I might write this book during World War II. I really wanted to look at how German Americans were treated. Um, I myself am about, actually, my family gets all confused about this, but I'm about a fourth German. Um, and I knew we had the Hess family in my background. And I discovered this, or I was told this. I don't know if any of you other Iowans had this experience, but when I asked about family history, I, people just said, yeah, we're from Iowa. <laughs> um, and I was like, that's, I, you know, everyone else is from somewhere. Um, so when I, finally, when I finally learned that I had this Hess background, I was in high school, actually. And at the time, I was working on a huge uh, national history project. We were going to Washington, D.C., and about the Holocaust. So my friends and I had been building this huge wooden Arbach Mach Fry sign with wire over it to um, put on our project um, to, to simulate what the camps were like. And I had my head thick with everything that was going on at the Holocaust, and that's when I found out I had Hess in my family and I was part German, and it was difficult for me. I didn't want to be German. Um, I have come to peace with that. Actually, a lot of my personality is very German. I tend to be very accurate. <laughs> um, I think John said, it's okay, you go over time. And I said, no, it's not. <laughs> I can't go over time. Um, but I also was really interested in how um, we sometimes shame our own immigrants our own citizens uh, when we believe we're at war with them, um, and how that shame carries on through generations. Um, and so I discovered that it was actually in World War I when German Americans um, had the greatest problems, not World War II. They, there were still problems in World War II, but the hatred of the Japanese seemed to have taken over. Um, in World War I, Governor Harding passed um, a law in 1917 called the Babel Proclamation. And it outlawed all foreign languages in both public and private spaces. Now, other Midwestern states and other states across the country had done the same, but the Babel Proclamation went further in also outlawing it in, in what were supposed to be private spaces. And he said, we need to sacrifice this small thing, our language in order to support our boys abroad. The law only lasted for seven months. Um, but women on party lines, on phones, were arrested for speaking German or other languages. Uh, people were arrested in graveyards for praying over their loved ones in another tongue. By the end of World War I, Throughout the Midwest, 18,000 people had been arrested or fined for violating these laws. That's a lot of people. And by the end of the war as well, 900,000 German Americans had seemed to cease to exist from the census rolls. They were now calling themselves other or foreign born, but they did not want to call themselves German born anymore. Churches were closed, um, names changed, communities fell apart. Um, I was talking to the, the woman that does the video here, and she said, I just found out that they burnt books, German books. And I said, oh, yeah, they did that all over. Um, and this destroyed families and individuals and uh, really broke up um, our state and our country. And it was strange because 50% of Iowa German farmers at the time were German-American. So it was a strange self-hatred, you know. I've changed, I assimilated, why don't you? Um, I'm going to force you to. Um, and so this family suffers the same. Their neighbors actually come after their house with uh, torches to force them to buy bonds for the war. And that actually, um, I base that on something that happened to a real German-American family. Um, so the book, though, actually begins in 1920. That's the center of the book. And I wanted to start it there because the story for me really began um, with the two youngest sisters of the family. 
And this is based very loosely on my own family history. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read next from Nan's section. She's the oldest daughter of the family. The mother has died and she's had to take over all control of the family. Um, and so this is 1920. She tells us, it was little more than a month before winter shut us in, when I last saw the youngest of my sisters, our little Merle. I woke to find her shivering just inside the front door when she should have long gone to bed. It was dark as a cellar in that hall, and outside it would be darker, miles of fields and grassland lay beyond the front porch. Our house sat alone on the prairie, far from its neighbors. The road to our place was a run of stubble and dirt. Merle's hair shone white on her shoulders, and she wore nothing but a nightgown. Her arms and feet bare in the cold, not enough sense to cover herself, though she was almost grown. I raised my lantern to her face. Why, Merle, I said, you'll catch your death. The look she gave as if startled out of sleep, her eyes teared, and she ducked her head. The door was locked at her back. After the war, father would have made sure of it. A draft rushed our ankles from the doorstep. The rest of the house was still, nothing but the wind outside knocking the stable gate. I touched Moore's forehead and felt it damp. She brushed away my hand. Her other hand she hid behind her hip, and when I asked her to show it, she glanced up the staircase and called our sister's name as if Esther might rush down to save her. I turned my head and Merle was off, the white of her nightgown a whirl up the stair. In their bedroom above, the two girls whispered together. When at last Esther stepped out, she looked down at me with her dark face, her hands very still where they gripped the rail. Without a word, she slipped back inside and drew the door shut behind her. Later that night, I would wake again and remember Merle as she stood in the hall. What noise had woken me a second time, I could not say. The hall had been cold when I'd found her, though her fingertips were colder. Her nightgown carried the smell of the riverbed. As she rushed away, I saw how her hair clung to her neck, her nightgown damp against her back, and the mat where she'd stood was dark with wet. When Merle was born, I too was just a teenager. But when first I held her, I believe nothing was so fearsome and astonishing as a child. All the many times we watched her and chased her and held her fast, brushing her hair, tickling her feet, clutching her hands. As I lay in my room, I imagined again the heat of the flame as I'd held up my lantern. I saw how it burned close to Merle's cheeks until she flushed. I took the blanket from my bed, wrapped it around my shoulders, and stepped out into the hall. When I tried the front door, it was locked as it had been, but the hall was empty now. Not a sound came from the room above. So when Nan actually wakes the next morning, the door to the girl's room is locked. They can't get it open. It doesn't have a lock, so this is strange. <laughs> um, they eventually are able to get into the room, and the girls are gone. This is strange as well, because there's only one very small window in that room. Um, and the family spends the next several days looking through the town, looking through their neighbors and not finding anything of them. So this story of the disappearing sisters is based very loosely on a family story of mine. Um, a few years ago, I discovered that um, just like my family does, wouldn't tell me that we were from anywhere but Iowa, it wasn't until I was almost 40 years old that they told me that two of my great aunts had disappeared together. And I thought, well, that seems significant. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but now I can use it, at least. Um, I became so fascinated by this idea. Um, if you go to my website, you can actually see the family photograph that I based it on. I didn't know any of the family members. I didn't actually ever meet my, my grandmother on my father's side, because she died when my father was 18. Um, and so the, the two girls that disappeared were her youngest siblings. They were called the little girls. Um, and I based all of the characters on this one family photograph. Um, in the photograph, uh, the two sisters are sitting on either side of this rather stern-looking father, John Julius. Um, one of the sisters 
is kind of leaning into her father. She's very pale, blonde, um, and she looks very, very submissive. And she, that became Merle. She was the youngest one. The other sister, Esther, is standing on, is sitting on her other side, and she just looks, she just looks like she's going to murder somebody. Like she just has this look on her face that she's going to cause trouble. She also has, which is interesting at the time, she had a flapper cut, a bowl cut. Um, so I imagine that she was the one that would drive them away, would drive these two girls away and get them to leave. Merle kind of becomes a bit of the ghost of the book. Um, everyone's kind of always watching her and always um, telling her what she is and who she can be, and that's not actually what she is or who she is. Um, and in the, in the real family story, the only other thing I know is that, um, so I knew that they disappeared. My family says, no, this never happened. Yes, this happened, but only one went away, and the other came back, and there's all these mixed stories, just as you, you'll get with family history. Um, so I decided just to go ahead and write it the way I wanted to, um, <laughs> because you kind of have to do that as a fiction writer. I did that with The Quickening as well, my first book. Um, I, I asked, when I was working, I talked to a, a British writer, Simon Maurer. He won the Booker Prize. And I said, I said, my mom wants me to talk to all the cousins to find out what happened. And she thinks I need to do so quickly because they're kind of old. <laughs> and <laughs> I might miss my chance. <laughs> um, but I didn't want to. I really resisted finding out what actually happened because when I saw that photograph, I felt I had my story. And I told this to Simon ba Maurer, and he said, yeah, don't ask. Don't ask. You need to stay true to the story that you see. Um, and a lot of writers do this, a lot of fiction writers do this, and what's strange is that that story then becomes its own thing, stays true to itself, but oftentimes will bump up very strangely with the real life story. Um, the only other thing that I knew, so that was the beginning of my story, the girls leaving. The only other thing I knew is that, um, that my aunt had found Merle's phone number very late in life. And Merle would have been 90s by then, um, if she was still alive. Apparently, Merle was living under an entirely different name, both first and last. That's strange, right? <laughs> A woman changing her last name is, is not strange, but changing her first name is strange. So what had happened to make her want to entirely change her name? Um, my aunt called Merle's home, and a woman answered. and. And my aunt said, well, this is, you know, I'm related to Merle. Um, and, and the woman hung up immediately. And my aunt called again because she was the tenacious sort. Um, and the woman said, yes, you have the right phone number, but she's ill right now. She can't come to the phone and hung up on her. My aunt called again. Um, this is a woman that my family had been searching for for decades. My aunt's going to call again. <laughs> um, the woman picked up the phone and she said, um, Yes, um, I will give your information to her. And if she wants to contact you, um, she will call you back. And so my aunt gave her the information. The woman said, OK, and then hung up again. Um, and my aunt waited, and my aunt waited, and my aunt waited. And then my aunt died, and we no longer have the phone number. So I don't know if that was actually Merle. My aunt did leave a note in her diary of making that call that said, I reached, oh gosh, I, I have so many fictionalized versions of this story that I've forgotten her actual name. I think she was going under the name Jean something. I reached Jean. Um, um, and I, but I think, and the woman said that she was her caregiver that picked up the phone. But I think I was actually talking to Aunt Merle. So my aunt thinks that she was actually was talking to Merle. But Merle didn't call back for whatever reason. So those were my, that was my beginning and my end. So how do I get there? Um, Merle, a very young, submissive girl, a very goody, goody girl, again in this photograph, leaning into her father as if she couldn't exist without him. Why was she the one that never came back? And so that's what I had to figure out over the course of the book. And that was, became my dramatic question, um, what happens to Merle? 
And that, I think, is that's the dramatic question that leads the reader through the book as well. Um, there's a lot of connections between um, the family being German-American and what they suffered during the war and, and why the girls feel forced to leave. Um, the mother actually dies. Um, the family is highly isolated. The family begins to turn against themselves. Um, they just don't know where to go to. And even when the girls vanish, they can't get help from the town. Um, no one will really help them. Um, and eventually, um, they send the youngest son off to war. Um, the oldest son is, has been hurt in a farm accident and he can't go. Well, the family's blamed for that. Um, the youngest son does go off to war and the mother can't handle it. She can't handle how they've been treated. Um, she can't handle her son being gone. She gets very ill and she eventually dies before the son returns home. And now the girls are motherless. Um, and that's part of the reason that pushes them away. Um, 1920, though, was also a huge year for women because we got the vote. Um, and at the time, even um, farming households were getting these wonderful good housekeeping magazines that had all of these advertisements in them about other worlds that they could never dream about. Now, most farms during that time, even up to the 40s, did not have electricity. And so one of the um, advertisements that Esther sees in one of the magazines is this woman standing, um, holding a teacup like this, and she's shining. And she's standing in front of a washing machine, electric washing machine, and she looks very clean. And Esther thinks, well, I've never seen anyone that clean, <laughs> anyone that bright. She looks like a princess. And the, the ad copy is something like, don't you want to get away from the day-to-day -day drudgery? Don't you want to get away and have a new life, essentially? And Hester says, yeah, <laughs> I do, but I can't, I can't do that here. So there's lots of pressures on them to leave. It's a huge time of change and rebirth as well. Um, I'm going to read another um, part from um, Nan. She, uh, they, they look for the girls. And, and they can't find them. And she always thinks um, of what her mother would have done if she'd been there. And she says, mother would have done better. The moment she sensed the door at the top of the stairs was stuck, mother would have come awake. Why the house might be empty with every one of us in the fields and several rooms off, mother could sense a window open just an inch. But I had gone back to bed as if sleep was what needed me most, and now my sisters were missing. Before she died, Mother had taken my hand and craned her neck from her pillow. What a girl you are, Nan, so tall. Then her gaze settled and her consonants grew long as if speaking two languages at once. With father, German sounded like a march, but Mother's throaty vowels were bread and milk and eggs. You might not have your own, my girl, she whispered, but those sisters of yours will be everything to you and you'll be everything to them. The problem is Nan doesn't want to be everything to them. <laughs> she wants to have her own children. She wants to have her own life. She actually winds up breaking off an engagement because she feels kind of locked in place. And she does herself dream of, of finding something of her own. Um, the girls don't come back. Uh, Lee, the youngest son, goes to, visit, uh, goes to search for them. Um, he's not the best person to go to search for them because when he went to war, he got um, a brain injury, and so he's a little confused. Um, the winter comes in, and they become very locked in their farm. Um, they really can't go anywhere, uh, which was pretty common during those days of uh, farm families when winter came. Um, and they kind of also didn't want to go anywhere because where would they go just to have people talk about them? Um, so Nan is feeling the weight of this. She says, the blame was mine. That's when I knew. I had forgotten my sisters. I thought only of hems and bedtimes, chores that begged for doing in all the many ways I could escape them. When mother was ill, how often had I dreamt of it, that fence with its four sides and the small stretch of land. 
a place of my own where if I opened the gate, I could invite someone in. Hello, Nan, Carl had said in town, and Carl was the man that she was engaged to. Carl said, I was wondering where you'd gone. I could only answer him, I haven't gone anywhere. In the past weeks, Carl had not made his visit as promised, and now I was convinced he never would. We were a practical family, he knew. We kept to ourselves, but underneath he must have sensed something new at fault. I'm different, I reminded him. The town had said as much in years past, and though we were innocent then, now with the girls missing, we seemed anything but. Uh, her sense of betrayal and loss takes over during a huge snowstorm. And they've just lost one of their brood cows, at one of the fences. She, she wandered off after having a calf um, and died and left her calf behind. Um, so Nan is sitting in her room and she hears a heavy crash outside. She says, I sat up in bed, the wind fierce against the panes. Taking hold of my lantern, I rushed out into the hall and opened the front door. A plank of wood lay on the porch. It must have blown from the barn or one of the outhouses. But the barn itself had disappeared in the storm. One of the shepherds barked, and out in the southernmost field, a shadow quivered. For an instant, it showed itself against the snow. Then it was gone. The calf, I thought, looking for her mother. Somehow she had gotten out. I pulled on my boots, looked back at the shuttered house, and stepped into the snow. My feet sank, the crest higher than my knees. The shadow loped and cried silently in the distance. Behind me, the house seemed as if it might float, the snow blakening the windows, and only the lantern I carried and a dim lamp in the parlor gave any brightness. The calf was running, stumbling as it went and caught near to stopping, and soon I was running too. The snow was thick under my boots. The cold burned my cheeks. The calf fell in the drifts, but surely when I caught it, I could take it up in my arms. I could deliver the creature from the storm, leave my coat by the fire to dry, and have done my part. I was close enough to believe I might reach out and feel the calf under my glove. Instead, my boot kicked something hard. There wasn't a sound but the snow, nothing I could touch but cold and ice and it wasn't the calf at all. A tree limb stood high in the drift, ripped from a far off pine and blown. A tear of canvas stuck against it and swayed like a living thing. I touched the wood, felt its spine. The canvas tore away in my hand. When I looked back, the house was gone. I turned in circles, but the snow had thickened. My lantern grew thick, the wick low, how far I had walked, I could not say. In every direction, my light showed only a wall of white. My footprints were nearly covered, nothing that pointed one way or another. Crushing the bit of canvas in my pocket, I set out again, plunging to my thighs in the snow. Surely I couldn't be far from the house. Only a few dozen yards at best, and the barn would show itself, or one of the fences would, and I could follow any one of them back. In the dark, even my hands were invisible. Was this what it felt like when the girls went? For suddenly, I was sure they had gone on their own will, alone. They had fought the strength to do it themselves, with, what with the older one leading the way. I saw her clearly as I hadn't for months, pulling me along, her hand small and sharp, and that fierce look she gave, hurry she said, as clear as the living, and when the wind tore up again, there it was before us, an openness I had never known. The land was gone, the earth uncertain at my feet, and everything was possible at once. I could be forgotten, the oldest sister who would never be missed, and this was a release the way sleep was a release, or that hour after the sun set, supper time done, and I could sit with my darning and escape into myself while seeming every bit present. I could dream terrible dreams then, of my whole self vanishing while my knuckles cracked over one last trouser leg. And in that new place, I could become boundless. My toe struck the fence. 
It was hours then or only minutes. I followed the fence line with the barbs bloodying my fingers and soon wrenched the barn door open against the drifts. Under the rafters, my ears rushed with stillness, my lamp brighter now by half. The animals in their stalls shivered. In the far corner, the calf lay safe and near to sleep. She stared as I crouched next to her, her eyes shining. Such a pretty thing, though we worried she couldn't be saved. We should shoot her before she starved, Ray said. As I lay down, the calf shook her head, scared in the faint light and hardly ready for the living. I closed my eyes and let myself drift. A stream warmed my leg, as good as any kettle water in the bath, and a sudden softness in my hips. The calf nosed my shoulder, licking the snow off my chin. I took a scab of snow from my sleeve, held it to her lips to drink, and her tongue stung my skin. I woke. The barn was still. The calf lay asleep in the far corner, its mouth wet. The rip of a hinge and the, do and the door flew open. I heard my name. It was then I was lifted up, a man's breath in my ear. He, labeled, he labored and fell and righted himself. Another voice calling my name and asking to carry me, but the man wouldn't give in. Stumbling to the house, he grunted, nearly falling again as he held me fast. My cheek dropped against his shoulder, the smell of leather and tobacco. Soon I was awake enough to know it was father who carried me, the way he hadn't since I was a little girl. When I was young, he would let me sit on his knee and rested the flat of his palm on his head as if in protection. He wore an old leather hat, a triangular sort, the color of moss, and he gave it to me whenever I complained of the sun. His hands were large, pocked at the knuckles, the whole of him wide as a barrel. Often he had carried me to my room at night when I dropped off to sleep in the parlor, if only to stay with my parents and their talk. Now he lowered me to my bed. Someone pushed a pillow behind my back. When I opened my eyes, he stood watching me, wild and gripping his chest. My Nachtchen, father said, his face pinched. You were found. He ran his thumb across my cheek and slapped me with a full hand. Never have us find you again. The room went quiet. My cheek stung. Around the bed, my siblings watched like frightened children. Soon the room darkened and they hushed each other. I was falling asleep. I would sleep for several days more, hot as an oven and sweating through the sheets. The others came and went tending to me, but it was father who slumped always in the chair at my side, his head sagging. It was father who said my name. I dreamt wonderful dreams then, of the girls returning home, of Lee walking over the hill, not a limp in his step, and mother taking hold of my hand. What a girl you are, she said. She opened the window and bought out her best skirt, fastening a belt around her waist. Your father says we have new sugar. How about a cake? The girls ran to the kitchen to dip their fingers in the batter. Not so fast, I said, not before dinner. Then I dreamed it was summer. It was late afternoon. Merle was walking across the meadow in her bare feet, her fingers sweeping the grass. Her white blonde hair was dark and wet against her neck. On her back, the blue crepe dress I had made her. The fabric was soft and slim around her waist, the fit only just loose enough at her chest and hips. I couldn't help but think how fine that dress was, how my needle had done that. And the way she walked in it, a pale spirit. Where's she going? I asked my sisters. To see a friend, Esther sung out. It was the last time I would see Merle wear that dress. I would love if she could wear it again. I would bleach it clean, take my needle to the tears, and hide them in new pleats. But Merle was too far off now across the meadow for me to call her back. I'm going to stop there. Um, this book, even though it's about German-American experience, um, for me, I, I wrote it um, because I saw a lot of the same things happening today. Um, us blaming some of our own citizens when we are afraid um, and, and, and pointing a finger um, to people 
to individuals who don't have anything to do um, with what's going on abroad. Um, and so I'm hoping, we've seen this happen before, and I know it will happen again, but I'm hoping now we can make a choice for something different. Um, that's the point of my writing this, to take us back to history and to say something of the present as well. Thank you. So we have time for some questions. Uh, we have a microphone here in the middle of the aisle. So I would ask if you have a question, if you would come up and, uh, and wait in line here. We do have about 15 minutes. Uh, I would just uh, urge you to ask questions. Sometimes Q&A sessions become speeches. So if we can make sure that we have some questions, you know, we have Michelle here who I know would love to answer them. So I'll turn it back over to you. And if anybody wants to go. Proclamation? No. Not that really? I found out. Um, Michelle, could you repeat the question? Oh, oh. yes, sorry. Um, he asked, were exceptions made for uh, Latin Mass in terms of, of the German, or the, or in terms the of the prayers? And, and as far as I was able to find, no. <clears throat> no, they okay. weren't. Um, also, was uh, German American Day, which is tomorrow, was that celebrated in Iowa before World War I? I don't you know. know. I don't okay. know. I doubt it. Probably doubt not. It. Okay. Do you know? You do. Well, well I know Reagan made that. Yeah. Uh, but October 6th is when the first Germans landed in America. That's why he chose it. <laughs> but it was celebrated prior to that. Not that much. Day. I don't think that much. He reenacted it, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question about the language in the book, um, and especially the names. So the father and mother have very German names, but the children don't, even though they all would have been born way before World War I. Can you talk a little bit about how you chose those names? They're all very Anglo, even kind of Welshish. Um, yeah. And I was just wondering if you had any, um, anything to say about the, that part of the family's identity. Um, so Agnes and Esther are, are still somewhat more German names. And Esther, she's such a, she's a loud mouth, so she's named after the German word for magpie, Esther. <laughs> um, <laughs> otherwise, um, and so she asked a question about where I got the names. Um, <clears throat> the mother in the family, she loved ger German language and she loved where she was from, but she also wanted the, the kids to assimilate. Um, so she also wanted him to be very much a part of this place. So she, it was kind of a, it was a crossover for them. And actually the, the, the kids don't learn that much German. She begins to teach them a little bit, but then she realizes that she shouldn't do that because that's going to get them in trouble. Um, so yeah. We have some real good friends from college. We have an, a good friend in Cedar Rapids who went to Cornell College with us, and he, he's Syrian. So his father came to Cedar Rapids, and his name is Bill. So he said that his father's generation all had the Syrian names, and the next generation all had Bill and Tom. Yeah. But his children had Syrian names. Yeah. Again. Yeah. And it's common with the immigrant uh, population to do that, I guess. They're, yeah, they'd be allowed to um, um, be stand up for themselves and be prideful of their heritage. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> for the, um, <clears throat> for John Julius' voice, <clears throat> I, I, I knew I was walking into a huge problem because he needed to have a German accent. <laughs> and how do you do that? Um, and I know, you know, Jonathan Safran, for his first book, had one of the voices had a heavy accented, I can't remember where he was, was he Ukrainian? But that voice was so jokey, it was comic. Um, and so it was kind of making fun of his accent. And I knew I couldn't do that, I didn't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> and so I knew I wanted just a little lilt of the German there. 
So um, I actually uh, taught myself German syntax. I don't, I don't actually speak German. There was another part I almost read tonight that has more German in it. It was probably a good thing that I didn't read it. <laughs> um, I taught myself German syntax, and I took all of the, the passages that I had written for his voice, and I rearranged every sentence into German syntax. Because um, German syntax, it, I think a lot of you guys know, is very precise. Um, and, um, and so, of course, it became gobbledygook. And then I slowly um, normalized it. Um, and I also learned, I, I talked to a lot of people and did a lot of research in terms, in terms of the types of words that um, Germans get wrong when they're learning English. Um, so instead of to do, they often say, oftentimes say to make. Um, they don't say, I wake up in the morning. They say, I stand up in the morning, um, which was a nightmare. I was constantly having people wake up, and I couldn't use the word because <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't think the father would know it. I didn't think he'd speak that way. So I slowly normalized it back, and I almost, I worried, it took me a long time to do this, and I worried that I lost it entirely. But I have had some people that have said that they can still hear it there in John Julius' voice. Um, so, so hopefully it's there, because um, I went to a lot of work to try to get it. So you were in small towns, I assume, doing a lot of the research. What were you able to find? Is there, are there archives? Were you able to go back to newspapers? What were you using to be able to build the story? Um, a lot of archives and newspapers. Um, you know what? It's, it's so funny, because I've taught writing in English for 20 years. And my students always want to find everything online. And I'm just like, you can't be that lazy. You've got to go into the library. You've got to use books. Well, guess what? Everything is online. <laughs> um, when I first considered doing the, writing the book in World War II, there was so much information, I got completely overwhelmed. Diaries, journals, um, full accounts of battles. Every um, squad in World War II has their own web page now. Um, it's amazing, astonishing photographs. Um, so um, with World War I, um, there were a few that the incident that happens to the family um, where the, where the um, town comes with um, uh, torches and uh, lights, they, they light their uh, lawn on fire and they're demanding that the father pay bonds for the war. <clears throat> and, they, and this happened a lot. A lot of um, German Americans were demanded to pay bonds for the war and to pay more and more and more and more. Um, and so again, that was based on a real life story that I, that was in an Iowa newspaper, a very small Iowa newspaper, but they had their archive online. Um, and then another story of a German American man who um, went to Germany and fought over there for us. And he, um, because he spoke a little German and looked German, he was able to befriend one of the um, uh, a French man that lived right on the border and, and was as German as possible, you know, it wore lederhosen and, and, and drank in certain cups and ate certain food and spoke German. And so he was able to um, uh, get food for his, for his squad from this man and was able to have a meal with this man. And the man brought out a bunch of rabbits and said, we can eat these, <laughs> and was speaking German to him. Um, so that actually happened. Um, um, and I use, I use that for Lee. Um, I had to find out how to skin a rabbit in writing that <laughs> scene. And do you know how you can find out to skin a rabbit? <laughs> there are about 40 YouTube videos <laughs> of how to skin a rabbit. <laughs> it's frightening. Um, so I actually, I knew, I was like, well, if I don't find, I, I just did my preliminary research online. I was like, well, I'll go further more, but I actually didn't, I didn't need to. And so I feel, I feel like one of my own students, like, come on, you got to get into a real library. But so, so people have done such great work. I also, I also teach at university, so I have access to electronic libraries that some people don't. Um, thank you for the book. I really enjoyed it. And one of the attractions were the place names. Um, and you opened by asking about what we knew about bottomland, and obviously bottomland isn't common to the whole state. Yeah. Uh, and then you later on 
put the story in northwest Iowa. I misspoke. Northeast. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because the two place names happen to be in the county where I grew up. Really? Uh, and that was one of the attractions to the book. And it, it's a, a town that's uh, got a lot of fame in the last, or infam, infame, I guess. Uh, the floods have hit Clarksville. Clarksville and yep. Clarksville was where the girls got on the train, as yeah. I recall. And they got on a train that had the name Shell Rock, which would have been the river, perhaps, or mm -hmm. the town mm -hmm. uh, that would identify them as well, mm -hmm. which is... Um, it was quite different than Davis County, which you talk about as oh, yeah. the origins of, of, of yours. But, oh, yeah. but place wasn't a big deal in, yeah. in, in, in what you were saying. But I, I'm one who is attracted by the place. At yeah, least. yeah. Well, and it's so I knew I needed to get the girls on a train. And I'm like, yeah. oh, God, what trains are there? Where do they run? Um, guess what else you can find online? <laughs> Train schedules from 1920. You can also find entire Chicago uh, uh, L maps from every year online. Thank you. Sorry, John, mine is actually just a point of information. Um, online, I looked up for us, National German American Day was originally celebrated in the 19th century. However, it fell out of favor during World War I. Yeah. So it fits right in with this timeline. Yeah, that makes sense. I wanted to give a plug for Iowa City and answer Mary's question. Mary, where are you? <laughs> a couple of blocks away is the Women's Historical Archives. There are hundreds of letters from women from the 1850s on up about um, the history of the Germans here in Iowa. Also, if you haven't been to Old Capitol, in the basement they have a beautiful exhibit that is there until January 1st, all about the history of Germans right here in Iowa. It's free. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Great. Yeah, you know, it, if... Um if I wasn't fine, if I wasn't already overwhelmed by information, <laughs> I would have, yeah. Um, but there's, there's um, uh, our, our state librarians have done an amazing work of getting that information up and just so they can save it. Um, I also, I gave um, uh, the Iowa History Society my, my grandmother's journal that I based the quickening on because I said, I think you want this. <laughs> um, it's got a lot of historical facts in it. And so there's a lot of women's journals and yeah which is great stuff. Though a lot of the women's journals, um, at least the farm workers are like, you know, got three eggs. <laughs> it was sunny. <laughs> they don't have time. If, if they don't have light to write by, <laughs> they don't have time. Yeah. Uh, you didn't read from uh, any of the scenes set in Chicago, but those were really amazing scenes. Uh, and there was a contrast with these young women. They were experiencing great opportunities, um, great freedom, but they weren't treated very well, obviously, as laborers. Uh, tell me about what, you're th what you were thinking about contrasting those two things, the, the freedom, the exhilaration with really being mistreated right. as, as workers. Well, Esther, in particular, has all these these ideas of, of being out on her own and running her own life and light and electricity in the city, um, and which is you know kind of a common story for our country and others. Um, there was there were a lot of labor unions back then that were already changing a lot of rules to help workers out, but it was still extremely hard. Um, and the um, the shirt waist factory fire in New York had happened not too long before, where the women were essentially locked inside because um, they weren't allowed to do bathroom breaks <laughs> and, and less on schedule. And so, so many women died. Um, and so I, I, I based that off of, of a lot of um, letters left behind by workers at the time, but also even workers today. Um, I found some overlap, like stuff that um, people are suffering in India. Um, the, some of the conditions are the same. Um, so the hours were very long. Um, they worked uh, six days a week, um, except for Sundays. 
the girls were protected um, somewhat because they got to live in um, boarding houses, or they were forced to live in boarding houses, um, with, with had uh, matrons that would kind of look over them and make sure that they didn't uh, ruin their, their womanhood <laughs> and make sure that these young women um, didn't get in trouble and could still be good wives and mothers. And a lot of farmers were sending their daughters to these places in order to make money. Um, but Esther and Merle go alone, and that's how they find kind of their salvation. Um, um, but those are dark places. I mean, most of the places, I, I think I described, because the, the lighting in most of those places was very, very dark, so the women had to lean over these machines, and these were dangerous, dangerous machines, very, very hot. <coughs> and I do have a, one accident in which a woman gets a needle in her eye, and that happened all the time. Um, and so um, people lost fingers, people, I mean, all sorts of things were happening. Um, so I was really interested in, in the industry. Um, and I actually, um, I went to Chicago and was able to get inside some of those old buildings um, and to really see what they're like. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was wonderful. It, it, that was very different from my first book. So it was great to, to research that stuff. I mean, what's fun to do historical fiction is that you get to learn all this stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, though you, it can also be a black hole, you do have to stop yourself because you have to write the book. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I think looking at our time, that uh, brings our event to a close. So please help me thank Michelle for a wonderful presentation.